The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Good morning. Who's talking? All right. There will be technical difficulties, I'm sure, as we go along. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we can't see each other, but I'm really appreciative of you coming together with us on this first virtual uh, mini conference with NARC. And literally, you can't see me. I'm having a little technical difficulty with my webcam, but we hope to get that fixed. Again, welcome. I'm Marge Vogt. I'm your NARC president and council member from Olathe, Kansas, and a proud member of the Mid-America Regional Council. The board, Leslie and I were very disappointed that we had to postpone our meeting in Detroit uh, for a future year, but I think everybody understands as our lives have changed greatly. However, I do wanna thank our SEMCOG colleagues who prepared for our visit and look forward to hosting us in the future. Uh, but as I said, I'm very glad that we're able to hold this virtual mini conference. I think you'll find that we have a great lineup of speakers and topics for the next two days. I apologize already for any kind of glitches that may happen as we adjust to making this virtual meeting work. But I think you're gonna get a lot of great information and networking, even though we're many miles apart. We've also had to postpone NARC's board elections and our, because our bylaws require that the board, business, and elections must be held in person. So they may very well take place in our February meeting when we are hopefully able to meet together in person as an organization. We are tentatively planning if we're able to do that um, in uh, at our meeting in the fall, we may be able to do it sooner, and we'll see how that goes. I'd like to welcome all our first-time attendees for joining us, and we have a few people that are non-members that are meeting with us, and I hope that they will become members. Unfortunately, we're not able to network with our first-time attendees as we usually do and amongst ourselves, uh, but we're delighted that all of you are joining us today. Meeting virtually has allowed, actually there's benefits. It's allowed many more people to participate um, if they can break away for a few hours a day from their work and, and not have to travel or get a hotel uh, if finances are limited. Um, and we still get to enjoy the educational value that NARC provides for those of us committed to an inclusive regional approach to solving community issues. As you all know, a lot has happened since we last met in Washington, D.C. The past few months have been a wake-up call for our local leaders. The COVID-19 pandemic has killed about 110,000 Americans and 350 people worldwide. We've seen an economic fallout that has resulted in massive unemployment and devastation to many people's livelihoods. And perhaps most sober, sobering is the continuing evidence of structural racism that we have witnessed with increasing clarity over the past months and weeks. Um, we saw that with the murder of George Floyd uh, and are into the second week of protests. We've seen the disproportionate impact of minority communities of COVID-19 due to inequalities in health community and community resources. We've witnessed overwhelming job loss numbers among persons of color. And we've witnessed problems within the justice system that is disproportionately impacting people of color. And as if that were not all, uh, as the unemployment rate for Americans in generally in general, has gone down nearly 13%. The unemployment rates for people of gone, color has gone up, and unemployment dropped in May for white Americans from 14.2 to 12.4. Uh, but uh, African Americans, it now stands at 16.8. In April, it was 16.7. A small increase, but no doubt, but an increase nonetheless. 
Our sessions over the next two days will explore these issues and begin the discussion on the way forward. We as community leaders must join together to begin the reforms necessary to address the problems that are in clear view now. Regional organizations can be safe places to begin these discussions as we try to repair the damage to the sense of community and shared vision of a, of a more just future by correcting the structural inequalities that are built in our communities. I want to thank, take the opportunity now to thank the NARC staff for stepping in and providing us with the webinars and the resources and opportunities to visit virtually as soon as the pandemic hit. Over 15 webinars on topics important to the work of regional organizations and local leaders focused on issues such as economic resources, services to our aging populations, workforce development, the nuts and bolts of moving organizations for, from in-person to online, ex accessing federal resources under the CARES Act and many other topics. And I hope uh, many of you have been able to take advantage of those opportunities. They are all still available on the NARC website and I encourage you to check them out. NARC will continue to keep us informed as the nation tries to heal from the devastation we are witnessing. We hope our sessions over the next two days are a welcome substitute for being together in person. And I look forward to some interesting conversations and discussions. Now I'd like to welcome Bob Cannon, our president-elect, Southeast Michigan Council of Governments board member and supervisor from Clinton Township, Michigan. Bob? Thank you, Marge, and good morning, my fellow SEMCOG leaders. It is my pleasure to welcome you virtually to Detroit. I was so pleased several years ago when Detroit was selected to host the NARC meeting. We had recovered from the Great Recession and municipal bankruptcy. The rapid revitalization of Detroit was something we wanted all of you to experience. To share some of the things that we were going to do, we were going to share Southeast Michigan's regional planning and intergovernmental success stories. We were going to host events from our offices in the heart of the city and a reception on the terrace of the 38th floor of a nearby office building, thanks to my fellow SEMCOG and NARC board member, Chris Barnett. We were gonna take you on a ride on our new streetcar, and we had planned to announce the winner of the Columbus Detroit Census Response Challenge. While we can't do these things in person, we are hoping to share what we can via technology. This video yearbook captures our efforts over the past year. It also shows some of the work and the efforts that have kept our region functioning during the pandemic. This is where the video should start. Southeast Michigan is a thriving region with farms, small towns, downtowns, miles of waterfront, premier educational institutions, and an abundance of parks and trails. This region is more than the sum of its parts. Welcome to SEMCAC, the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. Sir Muted.
Looking forward to joining um, you and SEMCOG in Detroit in the future. Bear with me go. a second. <laughs> okay, I have a little bit more. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Good thing. While there's a lot of uncertainty about the future, I am certain that regional organizations like all of ours have an important role to play. Our work includes ensuring health and safety, increasing opportunity and equity, protecting natural assets, increasing access to education, jobs, essential service, and amenities. I know I speak for all the NARC membership when I say we are counting on NARC to help us with this important work in each of our regions. Our thanks to Leslie, Eric, and the entire NARC team. In closing, the SEMCOG team had planned to show you what makes Southeast Michigan special and why you need to visit us in the future. Here's a glimpse of a video from our Visitors Bureau. Thank you. All set, Bob? All set. All right. All right. Unmuted. I'm ready, Bob. I'm ready for go time. Thank you very much for that presentation. Wish we could all be in Detroit today. Someday so back soon. To, you betcha. We're looking forward to it. So Thank let's you. get back to our mini conference. As I said earlier, the economic fallout from the pandemic has been very significant. And I think all of us uh, have felt that. Um, 40, 40 million Amer uh, Americans are out of work. The unemployment rate exceeds 13%. Businesses that were otherwise successful may face bankruptcy unless the economy approves soon. And I think we've already seen that there are many who have already um, have, you know, closed up their businesses, shuttered their doors, and it's quite unfortunate. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank is taking unprecedented actions by permitting smaller cities with their governor's approval to resell their debt and is propping up the credit and financial markets. And Congress has passed four acts designed to provide individuals with expanded unemployment benefits, financial assistance to states and larger cities, as well as assistance to farmers, corporations, and small businesses. And of course, they're working on more, especially to help some of the smaller cities who have not benefited and yet have spent money dealing with issues related to the pandemic. Now with uh, the protests occurring, 
Um, so we'll learn more about the current economic situation from a local government perspective. So stay tuned for our next session after a brief intermission while we get set up. Thanks for joining us um, on our first virtual mini conference. And we'll see you back about 1030. Thank you. Just won't let me get in.
Okay. It's 1030. Hello, Michael. And Alan. I'm assuming that we should just get started. It's 1030, so to stay on track, um, I would like to start. So thank you to Marge and Bob for helping us kick off our first virtual conference. My name is Jeff Benson, and I'm the uh, town council member from the town of Beverly Shores, Indiana, and immediate past president of NARC. I will serve as the moderator of this session as you all know, much of America's economic activity was brought to a halt as we banded together to try and flatten the curve of the coronavirus pandemic. The national unemployment rate has increased from 4.4% to 14.7%. The Dow saw its biggest quarterly drops in the first three months of the year since 1987. And in each of our own communities, I'm sure we can all point to local businesses that struggled or had to shut their doors permanently during this time of uncertainty. Today, we are joined by two experts to hear more about the economic impact of COVID-19 nationwide and what the long-term fiscal impact could look like for our regions. Alan Barubi is Senior Fellow and Deputy Director at the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. In his role, he coordinates and amplifies research from across Brookings Metro on how to strengthen economic opportunity in regions, cities, and communities. Michael Pagano is Dean of the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois at Chicago, Director of UIC's Government Finance Research Center, Professor of Public Administration, Fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, former co-editor of Urban Affairs Review and non-resident senior fellow of the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. We will have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end of the presentations. If you have a question, feel free to type it into the questions box in your GoToWebinar module at any point during the presentations. I will now turn it over to Alan for his presentation. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thanks to everybody uh, participating today. Uh, I'm Alan Berube from the Brookings Institution in, in Washington, D.C., and uh, my colleagues and I at Brookings have, over the last several weeks, um, pivoted to try to uh, make sense of what's going on in local and regional economies around the United States uh, and to inform the public policy debate here in Washington, as well as in uh, cities and regions around the country on how best to respond to the crisis. Um, so there are uh, essentially three parts to my talk today. Uh, first, I want to offer the latest evidence on the state of the U.S. economy, the view uh, then from regions, the level where you all are working, and then thirdly talk about what experts think is coming next in the context of the responses thus far. And hopefully I think this will do a decent job of teeing up what Mike is going to talk about in terms of the fiscal situation facing states and municipalities around the country. Um, so to begin, I think that I really recommend a piece that I saw uh, in the Atlantic uh, this past weekend that helped me give a name to a couple of the distinct forces that are really roiling the U.S. economy right now. On the one hand, you've got uh, suppression, which uh, is really emblem emblemized by the government shut shutdowns to uh, halt the spread of the virus. These things happen fast and they can be undone quickly. Uh, and the extent to which this is really the dominant force affecting economic activity in the United States, the recovery from it may be what some economists call V-shaped, sharp contraction followed by an equally sharp expansion. The other uh, force going on though uh, is recession. Uh, these would be the longer lasting effects of that suppression and the corresponding uh, changes in consumer behavior uh, and as small businesses close and fail and perhaps don't reopen, major industries face uh, not only uh, cyclical but structural changes like the airline industry, uh, and where jobs don't come back, 
uh, then we may be facing something more like an L-shaped or what some are calling a Nike swoosh recovery, uh, a much slower expansion, and that would be consistent with how the last few have gone. So turning to the current economic situation as we were coming into the crisis, uh, the U.S. economy had actually posted a record number of months of consecutive job growth dating back uh, about nine years to 2011. Then, of course, we hit March and April, uh, where the economy shed more than 20 million jobs. It's just a massive scale, as you can see, really dwarfing the monthly changes that had preceded it. Most economists had predicted that uh, these declines would extend well into May, but if you've been following the news, you know that's not what happened. When the jobs report from this Friday came out, it showed that the U.S. economy actually added two and a half million jobs in May. So the rollback of suppression that we're beginning to see in many states, at least uh, through about mid-May, seemed to outweigh the effects of a growing recession. Still, uh, we clawed back only about one-eighth of the job loss from March and April. And employment has declined, as you can see here, from its February levels in all major U.S. industries, particularly hospitality on the right side of the chart there. This is accommodations and food service predominantly. Although a lot of states are reopening in areas like restaurants and retail and personal services, uh, it bears noting that they're doing so generally at a mandated reduced capacity that's going to persist for some time, which, uh, as I'll come back and talk about at the end, will tend to limit the extent of near-term rehiring in those sectors. So as jobs plummeted in March and April, the official unemployment rate jumped to about 15% before, uh, as this Friday's, past Friday's job report reflected, declined to about 13%. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, for its part, admits that its survey instruments weren't really built for this situation, and it suspects that the actual unemployment rate may was closer to about 16%. As you track claims for unemployment insurance since the beginning of the U.S. pandemic, uh, that actually suggests that more than 40 million workers over the past 10 weeks have lost employment. Now, some of these people were uh, undoubtedly rehired as the, uh, the CARES Act's uh, Paycheck Protection Program went into effect, which subsidizes uh, predominantly small businesses for rehiring their employees for a, uh, a short span of time. But uh, any way you look at it, the scale of displacement uh, from the pandemic uh, from a labor market perspective is clearly unprecedented. We also know that already vulnerable groups have been the most impacted by the pandemic economic crisis. Um, households that have experienced employment loss, according to the Census Bureau's new Household Pulse Survey, are more likely to include workers who are young, who are Hispanic and Black, who have less formal education, lower incomes, and are in poorer health. They're also more likely to have children living in the household, and I'll return to that at the end of my presentation as well. And these impacts have varied a great deal around the country. There's really no place that's been unaffected, but local differences in the severity of the virus, the timing and the length of government shutdowns, and then underlying economic structure regions as well have contributed to different metro level impacts on businesses, on the labor market, and on general levels of economic activity. We're tracking these uh, at Brookings through a new tool that we're launching later this week. It's called the COVID Metro Economic Index. On a monthly basis, it's going to track 12 indicators across three categories, labor market, economic activity, and real estate, to assess these twin impacts of suppression and recession on about 200 metropolitan economies around the country and the extent to which uh, those places have recovered. So in the next few slides, I'll just show a few examples of some of the indicators and what we're seeing from the early data. First, just starting with the state of the labor market, uh, through April we saw really significant differences across metro areas and the extent of their immediate job loss. The metro areas here and in subsequent slides I'm going to show are coded in a very simple way by region. We've got blue for northeast, green for midwest, gold for south, and uh, red for west. So while less affected metro areas, not shown here, uh, lost about uh, generated less than 10% of their jobs from March to April. You're seeing these large metro areas, particularly in Michigan, New York State, uh, and Ohio, seeing much greater job losses due, I think, in large part to early action that their governors took in response to the coronavirus spread there. 
But you also see, and including on the Las Vegas on the left-hand side and places like Atlantic City, Myrtle Beach, Asheville, Santa Rosa, Santa Barbara, on the right-hand side, uh, tourism-dependent metropolitan areas also witnessing uh, deep early uh, job losses from uh, suppression. That reflected the situation through about mid-April. Those are the latest metropolitan level data on jobs that we have. But since then, we have seen deeper employment losses spread to other areas through our tracking of metropolitan level initial unemployment claims. And we measure those as a share of pre-pandemic employment levels in these metropolitan areas. Those data show big spikes in claims happening in Georgia, in Washington State, uh, and in California in recent weeks. Part of this, I want to admit, uh, may reflect delays in processing those claims. Um, but at the same time, you're seeing much, much lower shares in states like Utah, Pennsylvania, and Nebraska uh, claiming uh, unemployment insurance during these last four weeks after those states had experienced some earlier spikes in claims. On economic activity, uh, we've processed a tremendous amount of data on uh, TSA screenings by airport over the last few months to examine the reduction in air passenger traffic from the same period in 2019. All major metro areas I wanna note here have been severely affected in this respect. The biggest impacts on the left-hand side there you see in international air hubs like New York and DC and San Francisco, as well as in tourism destinations uh, like New Orleans, uh, Las Vegas, uh, convention destinations like Austin, which of course suspended uh, South by Southwest this year. So the impacts on the right-hand side, you're seeing a slightly less severe, although still quite dramatic uh, in Southern and Western metro areas. It's sort of mostly domestic and to some extent Latin American travelers. These include places like Phoenix and Dallas and Salt Lake City. Finally, real estate, I think is gonna prove something of a lagging indicator as the impacts of business closures and job loss ripple through housing demand and housing prices. But one area where those impacts may be more immediate is in uh, active listings of homes for sale. These are down nearly everywhere from their levels over the same period in 2019. So here we're comparing this past this May to the uh, May of 2019. You do, you do see the Northeast, particularly metro areas in Pennsylvania, and some portions of the South most impacted in May, which suggests reduced confidence there among their home sellers. Uh, and buyers on the state of the economy and demand for housing. So in terms of what's next, uh, look, I mean, Friday's jobs report is just another example of the rule of this crisis, which I uh, like to paraphrase uh, William Goldman, this famous screenwriter, who said, nobody knows anything. <laughs> he was talking about Hollywood, but you could say the same thing about the economy right now. And that's just because there's a ton that health experts themselves still don't understand about the virus and the extent to which uh, our behavior can modify, flatten, and eventually uh, take out the curve. Nevertheless, the show must go on for economists, and so they've weighed in with predictions about the pace of the recovery, because that's their job. Uh, and the average estimate is that this quarter, the U.S. economy is going to shrink by about one-third on an annualized basis. That's equivalent to about a 7% absolute contraction in just this quarter. Then the average projections thereafter are for relatively rapid growth, 9% and 7% in the third and fourth quarters, respectively. Um, but that's not rapid enough to restore the losses that we'll have seen from the first half of 2020. I think what's worth emphasizing here, though, is the tremendous uncertainty that still exists uh, in these estimates. Those are expressed by the error bars around each of those um, uh, you know, average tendencies there. The block is sort of the standard deviation of the estimates. But they're really showing that some economists actually believe the US economy could continue to contract through the end of 2020, although I'll note that these estimates were before Friday's jobs report. So uh, who knows what these economists will say, we'll, we'll know soon enough. Again, a lot is going to depend on the path of the pandemic in the coming months. My colleague Bill Fry at Brookings has shown that we're already seeing coronavirus hotspots spread to smaller, less urban places, predominantly in the South and the Midwest, and mostly to states that have already reopened significant parts of their economy. So whether and when that will lead to any retrenchment in business and employment recovery, again, still remains to be seen. In terms of federal policy responses, 
uh, after some initial fits and starts, we're seeing that about three quarters of small businesses, uh, pretty steady over the last several weeks, have applied for the Paycheck Protection Program resources under the CARES Act, allowing them to rehire displaced workers for about a two to three month period through forgivable loans. The overwhelming majority have now received that assistance, 95% uh, as of last week, but the assistance won't last too much longer. And many small businesses that, re that have reopened uh, have only been able to do so at significantly reduced capacity. So if you're a restaurant, you can only uh, offer outdoor dining or operate at 25 to 50% of your capacity. That's gonna limit the near-term demand uh, for rehiring in those sectors. The CARES Act also made, of course, significant federal investments in unemployment insurance benefits for workers. Now, UI benefits are set by states, and they typically provide a very modest level of uh, financial support to displaced workers, on average about uh, $378 a week, which equates to about a little less than $20,000 a year. Uh, so one of the most significant things that the CARES Act did was to top up those contributions by $600 a week and extended benefits to many workers who weren't typically covered by unemployment insurance, like gig workers and part-time workers. It also provided additional weeks of coverage beyond the 13 weeks when many state benefits would stop. Uh, and I think that these benefits have really done more than anything else to do basic things like how, help households pay rent, keep up with regular expenses over the past couple months. But again, the, the uh, expanded federal top up for these benefits is going to expire on July 31st. Again, in the average, uh, for the average worker in the average state, that's the difference between moving from a $50,000 annual salary to a $20,000 annual salary. Uh, absent, so absent a new package from Congress and the administration in the next few weeks, uh, that could lead to a significant contraction in demand if most of those workers aren't yet back at work. Mike is going to talk a lot more about the fiscal situation, but, but surely another key area of impact here has been to the finances of state and local governments. Uh, the CARES Act provided $150 billion in relief to states and localities, but most experts believe that's really only a fraction of what's going to be needed to forestall really deep employment and service cuts at the local and state level over the next few years. And again, this is another area where there have been some momentum, but it, it's really, I think, to me, unclear whether Washington's going to take action in the fiscal relief area uh, before, uh, really before the election. Finally, the sleeper issue, I think, maybe, maybe it's not that sleeper, maybe you all are aware, but it's getting a lot less attention in uh, the news coverage and policy debates than the reopening of restaurants which is what's going to happen with childcare and schools, especially come the fall of 2020. And you just see here among the, you know, the tens of thousands of households that uh, include children of uh, either school age or preschool age, uh, many, many, the, the majority, about over 70% where the kids are school aged and uh, nearly two thirds where the children are under the age of six have both parents employed. So the extent to which these, uh, these centers and schools do not reopen, remain uh, doing distance learning for schools, or they reopen at reduced capacity or on staggered schedules, uh, is gonna have a tremendous impact for a lot, a lot of households, a lot, a lot of workers and the degree to which they really can, uh, really can go back to work. Uh, and the safety uh, measures that those childcare centers and schools take are gonna have a big impact on their own workforces as well. Uh, so I think there needs to be a great deal more attention to this uh, this area and the extent to which is going to affect the pace and the shape of uh, economic and labor market recovery as well. So just to just to conclude, summarizing the suppression that we've seen due to the virus affecting clearly millions of businesses, tens of millions of workers, uh, and the essential services the state and local governments are able to provide, the CARES Act has done, I think, a great deal to help prevent a lot more dire economic impacts that we might have seen in this absence over the last several weeks. Um, but as suppression lifts, whether it turns into a protracted recession, whether we see more permanent scars on economic activity, on small businesses, on their workers, is gonna depend on a few different things. The path of the virus, how the virus proceeds in the summer going into the fall, 
how state and local governments respond to that, how they're able to respond to that, in particular in the areas of education and childcare, and finally, whether and how the federal government acts to protect lives and livelihoods, including through uh, state and local fiscal assistance. So that's where I'll wrap up. Thanks for the time. I look forward to uh, some, some Q&A to follow as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. We'll now turn it over to Michael for his presentation and stick around for questions, Alan. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, and uh, th uh, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction, and uh, Leslie for the invitation. I think uh, uh, Alan's overview is a terrific sweep of uh, events of the last uh, three months that five months ago nobody was was uh, predicting. Um, what uh, what Alan uh, presented, I think, was a, a good overview of uh, what has uh, transpired in the economy. What I'm uh, my presentation is about linking those uh, those big economic changes to the effects that they'll have at the state and local level, the, the fiscal situation uh, in in particular. Um, well, let me start from the beginning. There we go. Uh, the, uh, this is the cover of um, the June issue of Government Finance Review. Uh, I think it was one of the more poignant uh, artistic endeavors to try to understand the effect of uh, coronavirus on what appeared to have been uh, a very long uh, trend of upward growth in primarily in revenues, but also uh, in expenditures for, for state and local governments, um, and that it has come uh, it, it has slowed down considerably, if not stopped in many cases. Uh, but, the, uh, but, but what I want, want to demonstrate here is that uh, uh, state and local governments, especially municipalities and counties, uh, do not all respond the same way to changes in the economy. And, and that has a lot to do with the way the revenue is, um, is collected at, at this level. Uh, uh, I've worked with uh, the National League of Cities for uh, the better part of 30 years now in piecing together the changes in general fund uh, revenues of municipalities uh, um, in, in their uh, annual report called City Fiscal Conditions. And uh, pulling some of this data together, uh, what is well presented here and I think is the uh, part that causes great pause for all of us as we think about what we can see beyond the, uh, the impact of the coronavirus um, on the economy and on the uh, fiscal uh, positions of, uh, of state and local governments. It's, uh, I think, the question of how long will it take for us to unbury ourselves? This was such a dramatic collapse of the, um, the, the economy or the suppression, as Alan called it, of the, of the economy that has now resulted in um, the, the loss of over uh, 30 million uh, jobs. Um, but here is a way of thinking about how the fiscal rebound happens after a recession. The 1990-91 recession, it took somewhere in the neighborhood of four years for the average city's general fund revenues to rebound. This is in um, uh, in constant dollar terms. It took about four, four to five years to rebound. The, the dot-com uh, bust of 2000-2001, that was uh, exacerbated by the 9-11, uh, another suppression of a few weeks, not certainly as long as what we've had here and only in, in certain regions of the country, uh, but it took between five and six years for the uh, general fund revenues of municipalities to return to where they were at the beginning of the, of the dot-com bust. But you can see this, this really deep and long gray line uh, based on the, uh, the recession, the Great Recession, that uh, according to the data that we have on general fund revenues is that year 12 is about 2019. So last year, in constant dollar terms, the general fund revenue of municipalities returned roughly to what it was in 2007. So there's been a lot of lost, um, there's been a, a lot of uh, uh, depression in the uh, in the revenue collection of, of local governments, which has clearly made it more difficult for, for municipalities. Uh, the, the similar uh, data for the um, 
uh, for the states, except this is on the spending side, which is roughly comparable to what's happening on the, on the revenue side. As you can see, according to NASBO, uh, National Association of State Budget Officers, NASBO data on general fund spending from fiscal 08, a different starting year, the, uh, the metropolitan, excuse me, the municipal data was for 2007 as the base year. This is 2008 for states, but it roughly paints a similar picture that it wasn't until 2019 in constant dollar terms that uh, general fund spending returned to what it was um, in, um, uh, in, in, 2000, uh, in 2008. Um, one of the, uh, you know, we talk about uh, what are the, the best practices, which is a term that I have a little trouble with, but one of the best practices is that uh, we encourage state and local governments to put together budget stabilization funds, rainy day funds, reserves, unspent balances, or whatever we want to call it. Um, since tracking the uh, general funds of municipalities, uh, with the National League of Cities over the last many years. Uh, this is, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a report that will be issued later this week, so this is the first time it's been shown, is that not surprisingly, with the Great Recession hitting in 2007 or so, year-over-year -year decline in ending balances or the reserves of, of uh, the general fund uh, uh, declined. Uh, the purpose was to use those resources to help uh, shore up um, or cushion the blow of the decline in uh, in revenue to maintain spending levels, or at least not uh, uh, cut spending levels as much as they they might have been um, otherwise. And since 2010, uh, municipalities have, on average, been building up their their stock of reserves, budget stabilization funds, or whatever it might be called, uh, for the general fund. So that by 2019. Uh, municipalities have uh, uh, had generated as a percentage of um, of expenditures had generated nearly um, uh, nearly thirty thousand uh, or thirty percent of their thirty one percent of of uh, expenditures, uh, which which demonstrates that the the municipalities were taking their role as the um, the, the stewards of their uh, municipal finances uh, to heart, uh, preparing for that rainy day or for a, a way to stabilize the budget, which is what the purpose of reserves would be. Uh, of course, uh, no one expected the, uh, th this kind of a drop off and this, uh, the suppression, uh, this kind of drop off in the economy and therefore uh, of what's happening in uh, the financial world as, as well. States uh, similarly, were year over year putting more and more money in state rainy day funds or budget stabilization funds, according to data collected by NASBO. Um, th this is the median state rain rainy day fund balances or somewhere around close to seven to eight percent of uh, of expenditures. Again, during the time that uh, NASBO has been collecting these data, uh, th this is a record high, just as it is a record high for uh, uh, for municipal governments to uh, uh, to hold on to revenues uh, in their rainy day funds or in their their budget stabilization funds, but not all municipalities are the same, and not all municipalities and uh, respond to the changes in the underlying economy as uh, in in the same way. And part of that has to do with the fact that general fund revenues of uh, municipal governments are not entirely uh, of one item or another. Uh, just choosing out, just choosing the general uh, uh, tax uh, structures of municipalities. We've been uh, monitoring the general fund re uh, sales, income, and property tax collections of through the uh, through last year, just to to measure and see how much they change from year to year. And I think what what you see in this very clearly is that with the uh, 2001, 2002. Uh, recession, the dot-com recession, you can see that the purple and blue lines, which are the sales tax and income tax collection lines, uh, declined fairly immediately. And it's because, as we know, sales and income taxes are a much more elastic revenue source. That is, they respond to changes in the underlying economy pretty immediately. Uh, as soon as someone, 30 million people lose a job, they're not out spending a lot of money, even if those retail shops were open. And at the same time, so the sales tax collections are down, also uh, income tax collections are down as people uh, lose their jobs. Property taxes, however, lag the uh, uh, the changes in the economy and 
because of assessment practices primarily. Uh, we are today probably getting a tax bill from our uh, county or whoever is the issuer of your, your tax bill uh, that reflects the value of property of anywhere from one to three years ago. One to three years ago, uh, we weren't in the same real estate market that we're in uh, today. Uh, the notable thing on this graphic is to see that the yellow bar, which is property tax collections, uh, actually continued to increase during the dot-com bust. And it was a way that really cushioned uh, for those cities that are highly reliant on the property tax, cushioned what they uh, could, could do because th they weren't hit as hard as those that relied on the sales or the income tax. The property tax is therefore not as an elastic, it's more of an inelastic uh, response to, to the underlying economy. But you can see in the, toward the uh, tail end of the, this graphic that the year over year growth in sales income and property tax collections, even though positive, the rate of change or the rate of growth in each of those years um, had, been, had been slowing to something that uh, uh, we, we had expected to continue uh, through 2019 and possibly 2020, but clearly that's not going to happen. Um, and um, with the uh, with the decline because of the coronavirus uh, impact. Here's a, a, a map of the United States that uh, demonstrates the variation in the mix of these uh, general tax forms. Uh, the the, uh, the dark blue uh, indicates, and it's not all the state of Alabama, it's just for a few cities, but the cities that rely on all three forms of, um, of taxation. Um, so have some of the more uh, uh, um, the, the, the responsive tax structure, the sales and income tax, but also the property tax to help help uh, soften uh, any downturn, but also doesn't pick up on the upturn as well. Uh, the, the, the light blue are those uh, cities that are states, cities within those states that have access to the property and the income tax. Uh, the dark blue uh, is the property, or the darker blue, the property and sales tax, which is more common. Nearly 55% of municipalities have access to the sales tax. Only somewhere around 11% of municipalities have access to the income tax. And nearly all municipalities have access to, um, uh, to the uh, uh, property tax. Again, to just to demonstrate the, the diversity of, inc of uh, general fund structures around the country. Uh, Alan mentioned uh, that there are um, uh, that there are some industries that that are going to be uh, affected more than others because of the downturn in the economy, primarily those that rely heavily on tourism. And a report that uh, that uh, uh, Brookings did, based on data from Moody's, identified uh, five uh, uh, employment areas: uh, mining, oil and gas, transportation, employment services travel arrangements and leisure and hospitality, and uh, uh, calculated the percentage of those metro areas, that the employment structure, which uh, in those metro areas that relied on uh, those five uh, structures, uh, those five employment clusters. Uh, what my colleague and I did is we, we took those employment clusters and said that, and, and argued that those, those cities that are uh, more highly dependent than the, the normal, the average city in these five uh, clusters, the, the ones that are in the, the volatile employment areas, but also have as their fiscal uh, foundation, a very um, elastic tax, the sales or the income tax, are more likely to feel and will feel the effects of the coronavirus recession uh, immediately than those that are heavily dependent on the property tax and do, may, may not have access to the sales tax at all, let alone the income tax. What this graphic uh, uh, clusters for us is the uh, in the yellow are those uh, municipalities whose employment structure is in the uh, areas that include these the volatile employment uh, areas. Uh, the greater than average and at the same time have more than the average city. Uh, in a sales or income tax or a combination a collection of their, their general fund. And you can see a lot of, um, you'll see mostly uh, a lot of Ohio cities in there and a lot uh, because the Ohio municipalities are highly dependent on the income tax and a lot of uh, property, I'm sorry, sales tax dependent cities uh, that are in that cluster as well. Interestingly, the, the, the large tourism uh, destinations such as Las Vegas and uh, Orlando are to the left in the green area, um, meaning that their municipal finances are highly dependent on the property tax, 
uh, but do not want to uh, minimize the impact that uh, collect taxes collect connected directly to the tourism industry would would, uh, uh, would have uh, and and play on their um, uh, on their uh, their uh, their fiscal stability. But I, I, this this I, I, the purpose of this is to demonstrate that um, municipal governments are going to feel the effect of the uh, the, sh the retail shutdown. Um, more directly when their revenue uh, reliance is on the sales and the income tax than it is on the property tax, which eventually they will feel the effects of that. I think uh, one of Alan's slides uh, demonstrated that uh, the real estate uh, market, at least new construction, has, uh, has dropped pretty considerably. Um, and that the effect of the collections of, of, from uh, real estate, uh, the property taxes, will be felt probably um, uh, in the next in the next year or so. So how how states respond to um, uh, to uh, the changes in the uh, in the in the economy and their their fiscal base uh, also is is uh, in many ways uh, structured by um, uh, or constrained by uh, the the uh, effectiveness of tax and expenditure limitation. Um, this is just uh, an overview of a, a map demonstrating uh, where there are uh, states that operate under severe tax and expenditure limitations, which are the uh, gold and the blue, dark blue states, and those that uh, operate under a much less stringent tax and expenditure limitation, which allows them to res be responsive to their changes in their uh, in their underlying economy. Um, an interesting graphic, just because it's, uh, it demonstrates the importance of the uh, impact of the tax expenditure limitation, is that states that do have a very severe uh, revenue limitation, the green line, actually provide less spent, uh, uh, per capita support to their local governments um, than states, the, the, uh, the, red, the red bar at the top, uh, in which there are a no or few tax and expenditure limitations, which actually provide more support for the for their local governments. And then, of course, there are tax and expenditure limitations that are imposed on cities uh, by their states. So the the point of this is to to uh, highlight the fact that in some uh, states, municipalities are in a position of adjusting their uh, their usually their property tax rates or their total revenue levy. Uh, uh, th than other municipalities. So their, what I refer to as their fiscal policy space, that is their decision-making space to adapt and adjust to changing circumstances, uh, economic circumstances are in many cases, in many states, highly constrained by the state regulation uh, because of the tells. And in other cases, they are more flexible. They have, they have more room to maneuver more uh, what I call fiscal policy space. So, um, in the last few minutes, I would say, well, what what should uh, especially local governments be be considering? And I, I think what we hear all too often is this: is that, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, we're we're going to reorganize and reexamine efficiency. We're going to get rid of that uh, waste, fraud, and abuse line. That of course, <laughs> it seems uh, most uh, most. Um, uh, candidates for political office want to get rid of first, so there's always this, the reorganization and reexamination piece. But but then when you talk about the real actions that local governments tend to take, they tend to be one of these. They tend to either reduce uh, uh, ex expenditures, in other words, uh, yeah, you realize that uh, you're you're not going to have the revenue that you had before, and so adjust to it. So okay, so service levels will decline. Or if you want to maintain service levels, you're going to have to raise taxes and fees a bit, or you draw down the reserves, the budget stabilization fund, or whatever whatever else you have. Uh, but I, I would emphasize that those are the kind of uh, options that we tend to think about during normal business cycles when the decline in the economy is, we can feel it, it we see it, it may take a couple of months to unfold, it may take a year to unfold, and we can do a good job of examining the pros and cons of, of uh, the, the, the mixture of, of these options. Uh, but um, I don't think these are normal times. And so maybe we ought to, uh, in the article in the Government Finance Review, 
that uh, in the June issue that, that ends this way, there's a piece that my co-author and I uh, penned, to say that this is the time for non-incremental policy changes, non-incremental. Uh, rather than making adjustments at the margin, now it may be time to think of the following. Align the local government's economic base with its fiscal architecture and base that new uh, fiscal architecture on social justice. If, if, if anything that has come out of the, the last uh, week and a half or so of unrest is that uh, the, um, the areas of uh, municipalities are also contributors to the, the social injustice and the need to have a fiscal architecture that is uh, much more aligned with the economy. And that, that speaks, I think, to the composition of revenue. One of the easiest revenue sources to raise of the general revenues is a sales tax because we think that we can avoid it if we don't buy as much. But it's also the most regressive of those, of those taxes. And maybe it's time to reconsider how we layer our fiscal architecture on our, uh, on our economy. Um, the other is changing the heavy reliance on the property. You know, property tax about 150 years ago was a pretty good indicator of wealth. Uh, state and local governments were heavily dependent on, on the property tax, and those who were more wealthy tended to have property and those that didn't, didn't. Um, there is a, uh, is your, your, I'm sure you're all aware that the, uh, the Henry George land tax, uh, where it's a very high tax just on land and practically no tax on, uh, on structures and buildings, uh, experimented with in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in a few places, um, but it may be worth coming, if we're going to have a property tax, maybe it ought to be one that uh, is structured differently than we have now. Uh, expand the composition of the sales tax base. Again, as the most regressive of the general tax sources, uh, why not include services in it and why not reduce the rate at the same time? Why not include services that, uh, that higher income individuals are consuming uh, so that the um, the burden, the tax burden, sales tax burden on high income individuals um, matches or mirrors that of low income individuals. At the current rate, there, it's almost uh, a two to one difference in the uh, the rate, the uh, the sales tax rate burden on low income individuals as uh, compared to high income individuals. Um, and finally, I'd say this is a terrific time for. Uh, state and local governments and regional governments to propose a grand bargain with the states to enhance local and regional at uh, authority, autonomy, and, and responsibility. Uh, it is, it's uh, quite well known that during recessions, uh, one of the first areas that tends to be cut is state aid to uh, local governments, uh, excluding K through 12 education for the moment, but uh, for general purpose government, that tends to be the end. So, an opportunity to reconsider that. And with that, I will end my presentation and thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we now have a few minutes for questions and answers. I'll turn it over to Macy Morin on the NARC staff to read any questions we might have. Yes, good Macy. morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, we currently don't have any questions in the queue. Um, so just as a reminder, um, if you would like to submit a question, um, feel free to type it up in the questions box um, that is located in the GoToWebinar module. So we'll give folks maybe a couple minutes or so um, to uh, feel free to type in any questions. I'm seeing answers or a way to answer a question, but I don't see a qu way to quest write a question. I do see one question. Thanks. Uh, shout out to Chuck and Houston. Um, could you expand on fiscal architecture changes? Uh, sure. I think that question was to me. Uh, if I think of the way cities assemble their taxing and fee authority as uh, the way architects think about building and designing um, building. And that is that, that it, it's, it's usually a strong foundation of a general tax source, such as a property tax or a sales tax or an income tax or some combination, plus a series of other smaller taxes or fees on top of that. And the, the combination of all of that together provides a way of thinking about the, the uh, or a, a way of assessing the strength of the fiscal base of a municipality. It's its, its architecture. Think of it as, as trying to, to support the services that are being provided by the, the local government. 
uh, just, I think, a term that conveys, um, uh, we often refer to them as fiscal tools. And I, I, I think that that sort of sounds like, well, you can pull out the screwdriver or the hammer and you can the nail and you can do the, what I would, the, uh, the point of making that statement is that look at the, the entire architecture of all the fiscal tools that you've assembled. Does it support the kind of services that you're looking for? Thanks, Mike. Uh, next question is for Alan. Uh, what unit slash scale was on your slide on sleeper labor markets, um, in parentheses, child care and schools? Yeah, good question. That was uh, that was national data from uh, 2019 and again reflected the number of households uh, with children uh, and uh, different combinations of parents in the labor market. Um, actually, this week we are uh, running some numbers to look at what those circumstances look like for uh, families with children at the metropolitan scale uh, using some Census Bureau data from 2018 and 2019. Um, and so we, we should be publishing something hopefully fairly short order probably next week looking at what this looks like in metropolitan areas and hopefully also looking at uh, what are the industries in metropolitan areas that are going to be potentially most impacted by decisions about uh, opening up of schools and child care centers as well. I think it's just going to be a, a, a huge, huge thing affecting a lot of critical workers across metropolitan areas. Definitely. Thank you. Um, next, a great presentations. What are your thoughts on issuing additional bonds to debt finance infrastructure investment as a means to promote economic activity and recovery? It's a terrific idea. Um, I think I think it raises the question, it, so I'll answer the question by saying yes, it's a terrific idea. State and local governments can borrow money now to invest, or they could have borrowed money to make more investments in infrastructure and be uh, ahead of the game. Uh, I think the, the real question is why haven't they borrowed more? The interest rates are at an historic low, um, and and uh, there's really nothing preventing them from from borrowing now. So, um, if the if the uh, borrowing rate dropped by another uh, 100 points, a percent, uh, uh, would, that, would that stimulate more spending? Possibly, okay. uh, but state and local governments can spend okay. infrastructure you. that has almost a countercyclical effect to it. Thank you. Uh, next question. What is the way to sell greater regional and local autonomy from states that are jealous of these powers? <laughs> uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm in academia is because I could never figure out the political world. I think you folks are the ones that are adept at trying to get the states to listen to uh, to the regions. I, I know uh, CMAP here in Chicago, uh, Chicago Metropolitan Agency for, for Planning is under terrific leadership that understands the balance that they play in the Northeastern Illinois region with, with downstate and with the, the state of Illinois. How to convince them uh, to allow for greater uh, decision-making autonomy in, um, uh, in the region, in any uh, MPO region, uh, is it's a uh, it's a it's a very touchy political issue, and I I would be the last person to give advice on, on how to get involved in the political domain. Great. Um, next question: What best opportunities do you think regions have to offer state governments to help with budget reductions? Are there obvious candidates or programs to move to regional level? Do you think, Alan, you want to take a shot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it were obvious, we probably would have done it already. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, and I just think that so much right now, like so much hangs in the balance as regards the uh, federal government's decision on whether and how much uh, aid to provide to states and localities um, because the the scale of the need is just so dramatic. So to think that um, sort of moving responsibilities kind of up or down the state and municip municipal food chain absent those resources is going to help a lot. I don't know. I'm just I'm just sort of skeptical. So I feel like the best the best uh, 
best defense right now is a good offense. Uh, and to, um, you know, to, to speak to your you know, representatives in Washington about the critical need for those resources and the critical services that those resources will continue to support at the local and the state level and the, the dramatic and deleterious effects on local jobs uh, and local workers that failure to appropriate additional resources is going to bring along. So it's, that's not to, um, it's not to belittle the question. I think it's a very good one, um, but just to uh, give folks a sense of, I think, what the priorities uh, should be right now. Yeah, if I could just uh, um, underscore the last point that Alan made is, is that the, the estimates of what the effect of the coronavirus has been on state and local finances running between anywhere 750 to 900 billion dollars uh, is an, an astonishing number. Um, but it also demonstrates that the holes in those budgets could be just that devastating as well. Uh, then this might be an, a, the opportunity to think about um, um, stronger regional collaboration in service delivery in functional areas. Um, I, you know, I, I understand issues of, of uh, government consolidation are highly fraught in politics and identity and loyalties, uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for consolidating uh, services across a, a wide region, across the, the, the entire MPO if, if, um, if possible. And certainly a lot of progress has been made in the last you know decade or two uh on in the affordable housing arena and more and more regional councils and metropolitan planning organizations taking a, a stronger role in that i think the the shape of affordable housing needs is going to evolve greatly in the wake of this crisis and the need for uh, rapid response is certainly going to be there so the extent to which and that's not um, that's not always the state uh to uh, regional conversation. It's more about the collection of local agencies, municipal, public housing authorities, et cetera, that coordinate around these activities locally. But we did see, in, I think, in the in the wake of the Great Recession, that uh, foreclosure responses and the acquisition of properties that could be set aside for permanently affordable housing uh, worked better in regions where there were strong regional intermediaries that uh, to which the federal government could pass resources that could act nimbly uh, at a regional level level to acquire those properties, particularly properties in uh, in parts of the metropolitan area that provided greater opportunities to low income families over the long term. Um, so, if I were to, if I were to pick an area where um, efficiencies could be gained and uh, impacts could be greater given regional action. I would certainly point to affordable housing as one of them. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, any difference between county and city finances? Uh, many counties now do urban services. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, my, uh... My internet connection is unstable. Can no, you repeat well, it? It's hard when you're streaming video. Um, uh, any difference between no. county and city finances? Many counties now do urban services. Yeah, so I, I, if I understood the question, uh, what's the there there uh, uh, the the fundamentals of both city and county finances tend to rest on a similar base, which is there's a very strong tends to be a fairly strong property tax. Uh, there are some county, a lot of counties that actually have access to the sales tax as well. So uh, the, the the presentation of what's happening in municipalities uh, is not all that, this is on the revenue side, is not all that different from the uh, the county side. Clearly there are spending differences in which counties have responsibilities that cities don't and vice versa. But on, on the revenue side, uh, they're 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 fairly they're fairly similar sorts of sorts of things. Often the state will provide um, uh, more support to counties than to cities, but not necessarily. Approximately 22 to 23 percent of uh, of municipal revenue comes from the state, uh, fairly fairly substantial as and similar to, uh, for counties. So so as as general purpose governments, they have a uh, a similar a similar financial architect, uh, fiscal architecture. Great, thanks. Um, what are the implications for the Federal Reserve offering loans to state and local governments? How would that work? 
Uh, Alan, correct me, but I, I I understand it as a three-year loan uh, and pretty good pretty good rates, and it's primarily uh, it's a short term uh, as a short term loan. It's not a long term uh, bond. Uh, as a short term loan, the uh, municipalities are effectively asking for support while their collections are down, and that they will repay that money after their collections rebound. So it, it's a it's a short term loan, typically. Uh, uh, short-term notes uh, uh, mature in less than 365 days. This is one that goes out to three years, so it gives them a little longer time to uh, to cover costs, operating costs. Uh, remember, uh, the state and local governments aren't borrowing long-term debt for uh, anything other than capital costs. And so, what the what the Federal Reserve has done here is allowed them to borrow money for for uh, primarily um, what what. Uh, what used to be called anticipation notes, anticipating that they will be receiving additional revenue in the future to retire that short-term note. That all sounds right to me, Mike. Uh, and I do, I did, I think I did see even in the last few days the Federal Reserve uh, was looking to extend the ability of governors to designate additional uh, municipalities to access uh, to access that debt uh, that may not have qualified under the the previous um, strictures. So, and presumably for maybe somewhat smaller communities that were in a more dire fiscal situation. Great. Um, the last question I see here is actually towards uh, staff. Uh, will PowerPoints be made available to conference attendees? And just wanted to say that um, these sessions are all being recorded. So we will provide those recordings, I believe, to. Um, at least all the conference attendees, if not widespread, and um, the PowerPoint presentations will be available after the virtual conference ends. Um, so after uh, with that, I think I will turn it back over to Jeff uh, to close us out for this session. Okay, great. Thank you, Macy. And thank you again to Alan and Michael for joining us today and providing very thoughtful, timely information. We will now transition to our next presentation, COVID-19's Impact on Public Safety and Emergency Management, with our next moderator and NARC staff member, Neil Bomber. Neil? Thank you, Jeff. By the way, there's huge applause. They weren't <laughs> Neil, Neil, you're on mute. Neil, you're on mute. Uh oh. I'm sorry about that. Um, we're going to take a few moments just to break uh, so that we can get our next session up and running. Uh, so we'll be back at about 12:30 to start this, 12.30 Eastern time, that is. Thank you. Neil, are you there? I am here. Okay, well, I'm gonna look and see if there's any, I mean, there we've tried everything. So what I yeah. wanna be sure though is other people can't hear us. Oh, okay. Allow go to whoever chooses to choose. Um, I think we're. You like? Are you there? Hi, Neil. Yeah, your audio is live. It's loud. It, no, it's live. I was just saying that people can can hear us right now. Oh, is there a way to disconnect us for a moment or two? Um, no, if you can just chat on the chat box, I think that would probably be the, the best way to do this. Okay.
Can you hear me now? Hi, Joy, we can hear you. Okay. Now, okay. Can you see me now? Hi, Joey, we can see you. Waiting okay. for everybody else to come up. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. I can hear you. Well, good morning for those of you in the I'm sorry. Um, let me start again. Uh, for those of you in the Eastern time zone, good morning. For those of you in the Central Mountain, and or I'm sorry, good afternoon. The other way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for those of you in the Central Mountain and Pacific time zones, good morning. My name is Neil Bomberg. I'd like to welcome each of you uh, to this session on COVID-19's impact on public safety and emergency management. So uh, when we first began to plan this session, the major issue confronting public safety and emergency management agencies and their staff was the COVID-19 pandemic. As we all know, police officers, firefighters, and emergency medical technicians, as well as nurses and doctors and other healthcare workers uh, have been at the front lines of the nation's response to the highly contagious and deadly coronavirus. However, on May 25th, the public safety and emergency management world was turned upside down when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I believe I say the, op the obvious when I say that these are very difficult and confusing times, especially for our public safety and emergency management folks. Nearly 110,000 people have died in the United States from the coronavirus. Uh, this is clearly the worst pandemic in 100 years. As a result, public safety and management officials, including police officers, firefighters, and EMTs, are putting themselves at risk every day for our benefit and protection. As if that wasn't enough, the murder of George Floyd became a breaking point and put police practices in the spotlight, triggering demonstrations nationwide and actually around the world. Uh, while most demonstrations have been peaceful, 
there has been violence and looting, which has placed an additional burden on local public safety and emergency management officials and workers. This session is going to focus on how these crises have impacted local elected officials, local governments, and local public safety and emergency management agencies. We are going to hear from three elected officials, local elected officials, about how the pandemic and the nationwide protests over George Floyd's murder have impacted their communities. So I'd like to begin by introducing, by introducing our panelists. In alphabetical order, I would like to first introduce Joy Fuchs. Joy is a county commissioner from Washington County, Texas a member of the board of directors of the Brazos Valley Council of Governments and senior vice president of the NARC board of directors. Joy is also a nurse. Next, I'd like to introduce Marge Vogt, who unfortunately, uh, her webcam is not working, so she'll be with us voice only. Uh, Marge is a council member from the city of Olathe, Kansas. She's also a member of the Mid-America Regional Council Board of Directors. Mid-America is based in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. And she is president of the NARC Board of Directors. Marge is also a nurse. I think it's fair to say that Joy and Marge bring an important perspective, not only as elected officials, but also as members of the medical profession. Our third panelist is Alan Wapner, who is a council member with the city of Ontario, California. Alan's also a member of the Southern California Association of Governments Board of Directors and is a member of the NARC Board of Directors. Alan also serves on the National League of City's Public Safety and Crime Prevention Committee. Alan is also a retired police officer. Clearly, he brings a very important perspective to this discussion as well. The three also represent very different types of communities. Alan is from the nation's second largest metropolitan area, LA and its environ environs. Marge represents a mid-sized metropolitan area, Kansas City, Missouri, and its suburbs in Kansas and Missouri. Joy represents a rural area that is also home to a major university in nearby College Station, Texas A&M University. We've decided to make this session a freewheeling conversation among the panelists, uh, but we will set aside 15 or so minutes at the conclusion for questions and comments. So please be sure uh, to enter your questions in the question box. That appears in your GoToWebinar control panel. So now to Joy, Marge, and Alan, let me open the conversation with a very fundamental and basic question uh, from which you, that is from which Joy, Marge, and Alan will continue the conversation. So I'm gonna ask this one question and then I'm out of it until the period. How has the coronavirus and the various political actions in response to George Floyd's murder impacted your communities? And what burdens have these events placed on your public safety and emergency management workers and systems and local finances? And with that, please go ahead. Alan, since you're from the California, or maybe you want to start, huh? 
<laughs> well, I'd be happy to, but you know, Neil's question could take a few weeks to answer. Oh, yeah, that's uh, true. That's true. I, I guess the the comment of the day is, what's the coronavirus? You know, yeah. the, the 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 murder of Mr. Floyd certainly overshadowed everything, um, especially for public safety. Certainly, um, COVID had a huge impact on all of us, and and as Neil pointed out. And by the way, Neil, we're the largest MPO, not the second largest, unless someone has more than 19 million people in the region, um, or 191 cities, I don't think so. In any case, uh, not only am I locally representative of, of, of a mid-sized city, but also represent all the counties in Southern California with the exception of San Diego. So my response would be, it varies according to the community. My biggest takeaway from COVID at this point was the lack of communication between the various levels of government. The folks on the street were extremely um, confused. There are various rules, executive orders, all kinds of things coming out of the federal, the state, the county, and the city levels. And they weren't quite sure what they were supposed to do with it, especially for the businesses that, that weren't sure whether they were essential, non-essential, supposed to open or not. That was very difficult to deal with. Obviously, the economy sank everywhere. Um, we, we depend a lot on our airport, our convention center, arena, and of course the hotels depend on all those things as well. So when, when people couldn't travel any longer, um, the, the economy dropped considerably in, in, in our area. Um, I guess the only positive of moving from COVID to the national discussion about the murder of Mr. Floyd was that our emergency operating centers were already up and operating. So we pretty much just pivoted and we started focusing on that. And, and while the COVID was, was pretty much centered around the medical profession, certainly what's going on around us right now with the protest, and, and I have to divide it up, the protests that are peaceful and meaningful and, and the looters that I think are just using the protests as, as a, a guise to get in and do what they were gonna do anyway. Um, that falls pretty much totally on, on the shoulders of our, of our first responders. And I, I guess, and, and as you can see, the concerns are, are certainly escalating when it comes to police departments. And it's very interesting because I really wish that our federal and state officials could respond as quickly to requests from cities as they do from the folks that are protesting. Within hours, the folks requesting defunding of police departments and abolishment of police departments, it happened immediately. And I certainly wish that that would happen when we make requests. So now the question is, what's the next step? We're already seeing the city of Los Angeles pulling $150 million from the budget of the police department. Um, and I think if you watch the news, you'll see that already reflected in the actions of the officers. You don't nearly see the presence you used to. And as a retired, retired officer, I can tell you that when these guys and gals are out there working incredible amounts of hours with incredible pressure, and all they hear is how they're gonna get pay cuts and, and layoffs, that's gonna have an impact on them. Um, you see in Minneapolis where they actually have already taken action to completely abolish the police department. Um, and, and you would say, well, what happened to who's gonna take care of the community? Their answer is civilians. We don't need anybody with guns out there. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that spreads throughout the country. Uh, again, as a retired police officer, I certainly don't think that's the answer. I think it's certainly important we all look at our own guidelines and, and, and policies when it comes to use of force and, and, and potential racism, but just abolishing police departments certainly isn't an answer. So Neil, I guess in summary, you know, in our world of public safety and, and, and medical profession, everything is in flux. Tomorrow, later today, everything's gonna be 100% different than it is right now. Things are changing constantly. And of course, as cities and as MPOs, we have to respond accordingly. And really our responsibilities to our constituents to make sure they feel safe in their communities and they have a better understanding through communication as to what's going on around them. Okay, well, I'll, I'll bounce off of that when you're talking about the communication and getting the word out. That was our primary concern when things first started with the COVID back in March. Um, we were seeing things on Facebook that was totally not true. We were seeing things in the media that was totally not true. So what we did, we got all the entities in our county together, the cities, the schools, the Blinn College in our county, and we formed a joint information center. 
and we put out the word that way. It was a united word of what was going on. We put out stats every day of how many COVID cases we had, how many deaths we had, and all the things like that. It seemed to calm people down, although they still were, you know, we're a smaller county of 37,000, but they still were concerned about, do we need to close everything down? Do, do we need, what do we need to do? Should we all just stay at home? Should we close, everybody not work anymore? But those are the big things is convincing people that, you know, this is not the end of the world. Yes, it is something to concern yourself with. I, I chose from the very beginning to be concerned about it, but not to be frightened of it. And I think that's how our county kind of handled things. We, um, we just kind of, you know, we kept the courthouse open. I worked every day, even though I'm in the age group that's considered one of the high risk. But, you know, we just, we, our, our major concern was just getting out the right information to calm people down. And I know down the road, 75 miles in the Harris County area, and down the road in Austin, another 80 miles over toward Austin, they're having a lot more problems with things with, with uh, I think in Austin and Travis County, they're still closed down pretty well, stay at home type things. We've been off the stay at home until about the first part of May. So since the first part of May, so we've, we've been doing well in our county. We've our main cases were in the nursing home. That was our big concern with that was the elderly, the ones that are in the assisted living. And actually we had 27 deaths in our county and 24 of those were from one facility. Once it got into there, it just spread like wildfire. And, and we had to get our state senator involved to get the state to, to come in and, and take things over. People thought the counties could do that. That was another thing. They thought, well, you need to go in there and straighten this up. Well, we have no control over private nursing facilities. so. The state did finally get in there and take care of that. As far as the um, the protest that's going on, we're, um, we've had some very peaceful protests in our county. But I do know, again, in Harris County, I'm sure Chuck can talk about that, and in Travis County, they've had some unpeaceful protests. I think they've been trying to handle it the best they can. Uh, I think, like you were saying, too, in California, I think we have some outsiders coming in that are causing the problems. I think our people that are around the area that have known Mr. Floyd, and because I know this is his his hometown was in Harris, well, Pearland actually, which is right down from Harris County. And I think that they were the peaceful protesters and want things to just, you know, for people to realize that this can't happen. It doesn't matter who you are, if it's me or you or anybody like that, police need to not be so brutal. They need to take take a step back and, and look at things and and I know we can look at our, our police in, in our small county too and say, well, you know, some things they just kind of get over on, they get overbearing on and, and, and overstep on things. But I think, like you said too, I think that we don't need to abolish them. I think we just need to um, retrain. Uh, I think that they get to training too quickly and they don't have all the, um, you know, you get into a situation and your adrenaline starts running and you don't think. and. And I think that it's just some ways we just need to retrain some things, in my opinion. This is Marge, and I'm so sorry that my webcam is not working. We're going to try and fix that, though. In actuality, I'm sitting in my pajamas, and so I didn't want to. <laughs> not really. I am dressed from the waist up. But anyway, I will go into that a little bit. No, I'm dressed from the waist down also. But I mean, I'm in a suit from the waist up. You know how you do that uh, for meetings. Uh, we've all been doing that for a couple of months now. Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, in camp, so of course, I'm with Mid-America Regional Council, but uh, my experience in terms of dealing with COVID um, is primarily uh, with the state of Kansas. We have 2.93 million people in Kansas. How many, Alan, what's your top population in LA? In the city of Los Angeles or in the region? In the region, we're 19 million, half the state's population. In the, yeah, in, so we're, we're a smaller, population, smaller population, a little bit easier to probably manage in some ways. The county that um, Olathe is in is Johnson County, and it has 600,000, if you will. It is the largest county in Kansas and a wealthy county with a mean, median income of around 74,000. Olathe is a city, uh, the fourth largest in Kansas, and it has 147,000 uh, population with 75% white, 11.2% Hispanic, so we have a larger Hispanic population, 
and 6.4% Black, 43 Asian, and the remainder, just a variety of individuals that are in our community. Um, in Kansas, we've had about 10,000 cases of COVID, 232 deaths. Johnson County, 939 cases, 69 deaths. And we saw that more females were affected, which is kind of goes against what we see nationally, I think. But 93% of the deaths were people over the age of 70. And Joy, just like what you experienced, 70% were associated in the nursing homes. Um, the large number of deaths in the nurse, nursing homes. Also, which you probably heard about on um, the news, are meatpacking plants. Um, also experienced large numbers of exposure. And also in Leavenworth, which is also in the Mark area, uh, we've got the federal prisons there. And so large number of prisoners affected by it. But again, majority of deaths were there in our older population. Um, what I want to talk a little bit about is, you know, how we dealt with it. Of course, we did have a stay at home from our governor. And the county agreed with the governor's phasing, if you will, and that took precedence over all locales. However, Mark is a region with, you know, it's by state, you've got 109 cities in there and uh, nine counties. And so everybody, both the state and the county, had their own um, uh, phases that their government, either they had something, you know, where they were uh, having a lockdown and others didn't. So it became very confusing. And so we did, through Mid-America Regional Council, uh, at the very least, because the governors and the counties were kind of running the show there, but it gave us an opportunity regionally to gather information and to facilitate dissemination of the information. And actually, as everyone had trouble with getting PPE, um, everybody went wherever they could go, state, county, regionally, locally. How can we work to find the resources that were needed to protect our public safety uh, uh, officers, both in the fire as well as in police? And so that is where um, Mark in our region really helped out. Um, I do want to say that I know both police and fire are looking for after action report with Mark to see how we can do better. Even though we've got a real good Homeland Security, uh, good connections with our hospitals, but what can we do better? But politically, things sometimes get in the way and our regional councils are apolitical, and that can be a problem. As far as um, as far as the uh, the death of George Floyd and how it impacted the area, as you all know, it really impacted the Kansas City, Missouri downtown area. So that metro area, we are outside of that area. Um, maybe just about oh, 18 miles, that's it. Um, however, in the city of Olathe, we really had silent protests. They were nonviolent, um, but our police uh, in our city, as well as some of the other suburbs, did provide mutual aid for Kansas City. Um, and so that's how we were impacted there. And so I tried to think why we didn't have the violence and such. And yeah. all I could think of is that I like to think though, again, we're gonna look at this and we're gonna bring our citizens to be involved. But after Ferguson, we really started implementing some programs that you know involve the citizens. And we do have and have had 
uh, a citizen advisory committee to the police department. Uh, we do have various events, both police and fire, that uh, engages our citizens um, to include the, you know, sitting down with a, a cop at a coffee shop. And of course, during the time of the pandemic, we couldn't do those things. So, you know, again, it's hard to sort those things out, but we're not going to assume that there aren't some problems out there. I do get emails from constituents that talk about concerns about whites and, you know, your black or Hispanic or Asian population being treated differently. And so I think it is a heads up. We never want to sit and go, we don't have problems here. So it, it, uh, just addressing that, hopefully that gives a little bit of input um, as far as the Olathe budget, just like everybody, you know, our budget is uh, a, the total funds, 305 million, um, but our general fund is about 114 million. We're dealing with a 17% loss this year, 16% in 2021, and we have to submit our budget to the uh, to the state in August. So, you know, right now, um, for as well as police and fire, super uh, not first line across the the city, everybody took a seven percent cut, non personnel, but everybody took two week furloughs to try and deal with that, including the city council. <laughs> um, not that we were off duty, but we uh, cut back on pay just to to try and adjust, uh, make some. Uh, economic or budgetary adjustments um, that I, I don't want to take anything over from there um, I do want to share one more thing uh, which had to do with and I know joy you also have um, a mobile like a mobile integrated health care group right. um, that uh, is associated with nurse practitioners or your community hospital. And so we do have a, a group that specifically deals with people that are have the COVID uh, virus, but don't require hospitalization or sent home from the ER or were hospitalized and sent home. And uh, so we do have our fire department that either makes visits or um, uses the Massimo uh, system where they can virtually um, assess vital signs, respirations, O2 levels, and um, be able to guide them back to the ER if needed. Um, we also, with the mobile integrated healthcare uh, system, uh, this is for students. Um, they're coordinated with the school nurses, and um, they just, uh, these. They know families that generally need some assistance. And so they go out there and they provided food as needed, sanitizer supplies, and helping them with their kids, uh, schoolwork and providing computers and such. So that's some of the way our community, and it may be different than others, have been able to provide some support, yet it does take an additional amount of personnel and police and fire. And I'll stop there. I'd like to take a step back and look at the big picture again. I think what we saw with COVID is um, one, at least in our state, it falls on the county public health department. So they're putting out all the rules, but there's really no enforcement. Um, no one has the resources to go out. There was really self-policing and, and it didn't work. But I think what we saw nationwide and especially in Southern California was a groundswell of folks that were revolting against what was being invoked on them by government. At least that's the way they perceived it. And the politicians had to respond accordingly. So it switched from a, a public health perspective to a political economic perspective. And, and I'll tell you, everything pretty much is open in Southern California with the exception of arenas, convention centers, large venues for concert recording events. Uh, 
But I can tell you is that they said when you open up, there's certain safeguards you have to put in place. And we have gone to some restaurants and dined in, and I can tell you some are doing it, some aren't doing it. But I guess the biggest example is this, and, and I'm curious to hear from the, the two nurses, is when you have events, as we're seeing, especially in Los Angeles with 30,000 protesters, obviously not providing social distancing because they're pretty much in physical contact with each other. My suspicion is that we're going to see a spike in cases of, of the virus. And the problem we're going to have is that we are not going to be able to um, have any stay at home orders. We're not going to be able to have, be able to shut down the businesses because once we allow them to open, we're not going to have them shut down again. There's no way. These poor folks couldn't feed their families. They're going to keep their doors open. The real tragedy in all this is, especially in downtown Los Angeles, businesses that waited three months to open up got shut down in one night when they all got burnt down, looted, stolen from, and, and we're hurting for these folks, really, really are. So, so once again, I think the conversation did kind of pivot from the medical and public health kinds of perspectives to public safety and the discussion there, but the COVID crisis is still going on in the background. And I don't think, I think now we're gonna start seeing more of it because there is no longer any stay at home orders. We do have a lot of folks out exercising the right to protest. And um, with, the, with the strong political um, and economic um, feeling that we see in our country, it's gonna make it extremely difficult. And we have these discussions going on in the background by anarchists saying, get rid of government, get rid of this, get rid of that. It's just like, what do they call it, a perfect storm? I think it's a perfect yes, storm. Yes. It, I it's think really, it's really putting the pressure on everyone right now at every single level. It doesn't matter what you do, where you work, what business you own. Um, and of course, we know at the local level, it all falls on us. It all falls on nobody us. cares right. whether it's federal, state, or anything else. They're, we're the ones that they're going to see in the grocery store. We're the ones that they're going to be calling at home. And we're going to have to provide, you know, all the voids that aren't being filled. Right. Ellen, you're saying I, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead you're, you're saying the same things I've been thinking all weekend. Uh, will this all spike? You know, will will there be a the uh, will the media still be saying about all oh, how many cases we have and everything like that when all these things with George Floyd and the protesters are going on? If there comes and, and people are not being tested or they don't have a spike in things, it kind of tells you some things that was just blown out of proportion from the very beginning. I don't think because of the protests and because of what the people have been through, it'd be fair to make these people close down again because, like you said, they have to feed their families. I feel so sorry for when, when they were closed just for takeout orders only. I would go and give them big tips because I understand. You know, they're, they're in there just trying to make it. and. And to me, I, I think that, you know, so many things were just, I don't know, so politicized. I'm if I get shot, they might just take me off this whole seminar. I don't know. But I think so many things <laughs> were so politicized from the very beginning when we had other things as an old nurse who went through the HIV scare, who went through the Ebola, who went through the swine flu, the bird flu and everything like that. We use PPE, we were concerned, but you know, it wasn't made this big of a deal with this. And just as many people probably died then and you know sometimes even with the assisted living homes i look at those and think i'm going to try to get some stats from some of the ones from around here how many people in a normal year pass away that are in there you don't go to assisted living to get well you're, you're going there because your your family can't take care of you because you don't have family or things like that because your health is poor and and like i said i, I just think that it's it's just so many it, a perfect storm like you said alan that everything is just coming together where it, it looks like sometimes you wonder, is this the end of the world? Is is the day coming? Um, you just hope that people find, and I'll probably get shocked for this too, find God back again, because I, I think that we need to all be whatever whatever God you worship. You all need to, to find that back again, because I, I just don't know where this world is going. And in my small county, I don't see it nearly as bad, but when I see the things on the news, I'm kind of, well, my friends is more so they quit watching the news. I can't stand to watch it anymore. But I just think that it's it's something that it'll be interesting to see the next few weeks if it does spike. And I know Harris County Day, they're having the visitation for George Floyd and they're also having the funeral tomorrow. So it'll be interesting to see what's, 
I hadn't seen anything. There's more of what's going on over there, but I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff happening there. I think Joe Biden's going there and Al Sharpton and a few people like that. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm like you, Alan, I'm, I'm anxious to see and, and see what happens in the future. Um, I really enjoy the, uh, Bob and people from Detroit. I really enjoy watching your police chief from Detroit. I mean, he is so sensible. I just, I just really, I can sit and watch him and just think, gosh, this, this guy's got it all together. He, he understands everything. And, and, you know, he's, 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 he's got kind of like me, I guess, got some of that old common sense in him. And, and it's interesting to watch some of the ones that get there. And then some of the young ones we, in, in Texas, we have a bunch of new judges. They just got elected a year and a half ago. And I mean, this is like for baptism by fire because this is something we hadn't had, like you said, in a hundred years, and now they're having to try to deal with this. And and some like in the big big counties like Harris, they opened up these big $60 million hospitals, which they didn't need, and wound up just wasting all that money, whether it be, it be state money or county money that you could use for something else. And I don't know, it just, it was so many knee jerk reactions from the very beginning. Even our local health authority wanted to shut everything down and get the National Guard in here. I was like, whoa, whoa, no, we're, we're not doing anything close to that because we we can handle these things. And and anyways, I, like I said, I, I probably, if you shut me off already, that's okay. I, I understand. That's just my opinion no. and what I've dealt with for many years. <laughs> no, I think, you know, uh, uh, you're right, it's a perfect storm. We're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with this, the bubbling up of the true amount of racism that we're seeing. Um, and then you throw on uh, the lack of jobs and income, the economy, and it it, it, it is a nightmare, isn't it? Um, as far as COVID, you know, um, and I think it, we as a, a panel talked about it, you know, the virus that was in China, uh, my understanding is was it kind of mutated and it it was different in Europe and the virus we got I understand is the one from Europe. I am hoping and viruses mutate. Anybody that uh, gets a flu shot, you know that it only covers a certain amount. We know that people's immune systems are different. So I like Alan and Joy. I look forward to seeing what will happen after all these protests. We will really know um, what's going on. I will tell you, we have not seen uh, a real spike from uh, Memorial Day, though, you know, they talk about 14 to 21 days now that you have to watch and see. Um, and many of you saw all the people in Missouri at the lake, and I, that was on all over the news. Um, so there's a couple of things that I am looking at to see, yes, what will happen. I, in our state, um, we're open now. Um, the governor did shut us down for, uh, let's see, the end of March to just about a week, two weeks ago um a week ago it's hard for me to because i'm an essential person as a nurse but um the, the she is a democratic governor the republicans um in closing session wanted to uh, uh not have her put any more orders executive orders closing uh places and uh part of it was that she could finish the phasing well she just said no, I won't finish the phasing, we'll just open up, but I'm gonna be able to do this again if I need to. I think, I will tell you, I'm in some ways, the closing down um, educated people. They, they sanitize, they wear masks, they're doing the social distancing. And even though now, now we've got self-enforcement and mm -hmm. I think it is almost, 50-50, if I go to the store in the morning, primarily everybody's got masks on and everything. If I go around four o'clock in the afternoon, it's probably 50-50. In the restaurants, the Kansas City Star in today's uh, paper, so you can go online, they actually went to, I don't know, 50 restaurants and just wanted to see what people were doing, the restaurant owners, the servers, the, as well as people coming in. 
And so the bottom line is, you're right, it's going to be self-enforcement. We really don't know what's going to happen. I hope that we won't see another 110 million people die. I mean, never have we seen, even with the flu, 110, I'm sorry, 110,000 people die um, in just three and a half months. That's a lot. Um, I hope that maybe there is a mutation. I hope that the, the majority of us, our immune systems, that we develop antibodies and because we have it, but we didn't experience it. But only time will tell. And it's going to take self-enforcement. And what I'm seeing is you've got two groups, those that believe it, those that don't. And those that do believe it, um, they will... A demand their stores, their restaurants, their services to do the social isolation, the sanitizing. They're going to look for those things. And then you're going to have the other group that it isn't going to matter. Um, but I think this will continue to carry on probably until we get the vaccine. And then we all have to be comfortable with that. There are those again. You've got the divide again, those that believe in vaccines and those that don't. So time will tell. I think for now, just like you, you uh, Joy and Alan said, it's really about self-enforcement. And I think we even saw in China, you know, uh, with SARS and some of those, when you'd see pictures, even after the, the epidemic was over, you still see people wearing masks and such. And I think it just has become a part of their culture for some. I don't know. Will that now happen in the United States? I don't know. Um, uh, excuse me, both or all three of you. Before before we go to questions and answers, I did want to just jump in with a question, uh, something that we had talked about before, and that uh -huh. is, what, what do you see as the fiscal impact? on your county and cities and depending on that impact and that is from having to deal with COVID of course and then having to deal with the repercussions uh, of the uh, George Floyd murder. Um, what are those implications for the future and how are you going to deal with them? Well, I'll well, start. I okay, let's well, go ahead Marge. No, no, I was going to say I think I mention, you know, the fact that we're late, you were not hiring anybody, people are taking, having to take furloughs, we laid off seasonals, we're reducing our departments by some, you know, cuts in non-personnel related things. Um, we are self-insured, so we are going to take a health insurance holiday for one month, that gives us $600,000. We also uh, have like a lease plan that each department has to pay into to buy new vehicles, that's going to give us uh, 1.25 million. So those are the ways that we're doing it. Yes, the, there will be um, noticeable things that we're unable to do. We won't be mowing the media. We, you know, um, but it, but we're going to provide what's most important to our uh, people, and that is public safety, and that'll be police and fire. So we will not be cutting you know, the first line uh, essential uh, providers of safety in our community. I think this all matters, I mean, from here at least, in my opinion, of how you've been um, fiscally before. Fiscally before. Um, we've always had a healthy reserve, enough to where we could make it on things because we've been through hurricanes and, and things like that, that where we need to have money on hand just to get things ready so we can get the FEMA money. Um, our county, we, we actually are hiring people because we're needing, we're having employees that have gone to other things and we're needing new people. Um, we will be fine. Um, we, we have enough reserves to cover things. We haven't furloughed anybody. We've been working from day one. We've had our courthouse uh, closed to the public, but open to our people where they could call in and, and get things done. And also the other offices that we have. 
our, our, our sheriff's office has taken care of themselves by making sure they're doing everything sanitarily. Our EMS has been the ones on the front line because as you said, we have the community paramedic program where they actually go out to the nursing homes and go out to the homes of people that have the COVID to make sure how they're doing and everything. And uh, they've just learned a whole new way to sanitize their uh, ambulances and how to make sure on themselves that they keep things sanitized. We're lucky because in Texas, they just, in our last session, put the emergency management under Texas A&M. And the guy's name is Nim Kidd, who is our emergency management coordinator for the state. By having under Texas A&M, our extension service is under Texas A&M as well. So the extension service uh, delivered PPE to all the different counties and cities and everybody that needed those. They were able to get those, get them allocated and get them to the different people. They were our saviors. I mean, they were out there, the agents, when they weren't doing things, they weren't doing face to face with people as far as the um, what they train people on through extension, the homemaking, the agriculture, things like that, and the 4-H, they were out there delivering the PPE to the people. So it's been a great partnership. That was one of the best things our state legislature ever did was put it under agriculture. Well, a and is more than agriculture college now, but with having the, the extension service under Texas A&M, it all worked out well. Um, like I said, our city here, they, they are having to furlough people. They're having to have people take off and having to uh, not hire and put a freeze on. But like I said, it's just, and we've always known that we've been a lot more fiscally conservative than they have. So we feel pretty good about this. We've been getting some of the CARES money, which is really great because it helps us for some of our overtime for the EMTs and paramedics and things that are having to really, really be getting in the, in the front lines, like I said. So it's, I think we'll be okay. Smaller counties probably have been, been okay, but I, I know the bigger counties like Harris, Travis, Dallas County, Tarrant County, they'll probably all have, have issues because they've had a lot of things going on with the police and, and all the different riots and stuff. So by us not having the riots, that's helped us a whole lot, but I know that, that it will impact the budgets. We, we start budget June 15th next week. So we'll see how everything's looking, how our taxes. The big thing, because we are such a property tax state in Texas, the big thing will be to see if people can afford to pay their property taxes. Because that's our, our sales tax goes against our property tax the way the thing is written by the legislature. So uh, we'll have to see how things come in. Usually we're at 98% uh, uh, where they pay their taxes and stuff. So we'll see how it goes this year. Luckily, most of the people that were laid off are back working again in our county, so hopefully they'll all be doing pretty good. Alan, your turn. Well, well thank you. You know, it's a recession, and we dealt with recessions before. We gotta do the best that we can. I think that's different about this one is this recession is based on people's emotions. So I don't, I don't think that the economy is gonna turn that quickly until people feel comfortable leaving their homes and going out and shopping, assuming that the stores are still open. As we know, brick and mortar were going downhill anyway, and with this, it just expedited that. I, I know in our town, we have a lot of e-commerce going on, and fortunately, that kind of sustained us for the past few months. Um, so I think we have to make the same cuts that we did during the last recession. For us in our area, it's going to be deeper. It is going to affect level of services. We are looking, we're not looking at layoffs, but we're certainly offering um, early retirements, things like that, to have employees leave. That's the biggest cost to a city. Um, California, unfortunately, we don't have the same taxing um, advantages other states do. Localities, the only tax that we have is sales tax. We get 1% sales tax. Property taxes, we don't get. Some cities get 0% property tax. Some get up to 15, but that's it. All the rest of the money goes to uh, to the school system. We have no more redevelopment or, or, or tax or property tax increment um, tools available. Um, fortunately, land values are holding their own, but again, that doesn't help local cities. We really depend on sales tax, parking tax, bed taxes, all the ones that really got hit hard. So we recognize that revenues are down. Um, expenses. You know, they're the same, they're going to be more because we have certainly we have more needs as far as um, COVID and, and now obviously we have to be able to staff for all the protests that are going on. So it's not going to be easy. Hopefully our constituents understand that. They understand it's going to have a huge impact to them as if they haven't already had enough of an impact. It's very difficult. The other thing, I tried to work with our businesses. I said, look, it's not an on-off switch. When we open up for business again, 
it's not going to happen immediately. People have changed their shopping habits. They've changed everything. I said, if you're running a restaurant, don't expect to call your produce provider and get produce delivered. They may not be in business any longer, it, you know, any of your vendors. And it's going to yeah. take a long time to really wind up again. Well, unfortunately, we didn't have that opportunity. Before we had an opportunity to start getting ready to open, we got hit with the um, with the the civil unrest that we're getting now. So it, it just it's it's difficult. And in times like this, people look for leadership. They look for decisions. They look for someone to take control of the situation. And it's extremely difficult when we at the local level have very little authority as to what's going to be going on. No, I have one thing I got to add. I forgot to say that our, our COG, Bryce Valley COG, also delivered, delivered PPE to the different counties and stuff. They were very instrumental. As you know, our COG has got a mixture of all different things there, and they were very instrumental in getting the PPE out to the to make sure we had them for the nursing homes, first responders, and schools and places like that that needed them. And, and Blaine College has been great, too. We, we, like, so we worked in really cooperation together, so I almost forgot about them. The BB, Brazos Valley Council of Governments, you know they're the best one. So adding, adding to what you said, Ellen, yeah, I, I'm with you. And this feels like you said, the recession in 2008. And uh, the majority of my council, as well as my city manager and staff were there then. And so in some ways, it's very easy for us to, okay, what did we do before that worked type of thing? And our goal is not to dip into reserves unless we absolutely have to. So we do other things without, as best we can without um, decreasing the quality and most importantly, public safety. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the CARES Act. Um, uh, it has been helpful to the city. Those that we furloughed for two weeks, anybody that was $56,000 a year or less, they actually were made whole with the CARES Act. But the issue now is about how do we get compensated for anything that we did with COVID? And as you know, Alan, you're gonna get a big lump sum. Joy, you're not. I'm no. not. And um, so our count, and, and so the state isn't interested in giving us anything of their 1.25 billion, and the county isn't wanting to give us anything of their 116 million, yet the county, which I said is 600,000 population, but only 15,000 live in unincorporated areas. That's the, where they provide service. And I can tell you that when I talk to my police and fire, they got some assistance with PPE. And yes, the county is doing some testing, but not enough to use up 116 million. They've been holding it for over a month now. They've got till the end of December. And so all the cities in our county are now coming together to say, and putting some pressure on the county chair and commissioners to say, wait a minute, <laughs> we're providing a large amount of service. And that, if they help us out with that, will also help us in terms of our budget. And I don't know what you're doing, Joy. I guess you'd have to go to the state because you don't yeah. get the 500,000. Yeah. Uh, we, like I said, we've gotten a little bit from the CARES Act, not not over me, I mean, not that much, yeah. but I was going to say one more thing. We do have a place in Washington County, it's called Faith Mission, and they have always been working with us to take care of the people that are less fortunate, that need help, either through medical, housing, or whatever. Well, we immediately, when this all started, we started a phone bank for people that had questions and needed assistance, like with groceries and stuff like that. And we still have them running. So we'll use our CARES Act money to repay them for some of the things that they did. We're using it. And, and we as a county took the lead in our county. We were the ones that, that kind of took the lead on everything. The city is working with us, but we more or less took the lead on, on the things. And, and like I said, it's been a good good working relationship with the cities that we have. We have two little cities, Brennan, one bigger city, Brenham, and one smaller city, uh, Burton. 
but we, um, like I said, we work together and we will, unlike your county, we will share what we have, what we get with the ones that have helped us through all this. Everybody's holding that money close to their chest because they're all, you know, having a, you know, sales tax right. for, yes. is a big way in which uh, we uh, fund our, our general funds, et cetera. So it is a problem. And I think regional councils, and I know NARC, as well as Mark are looking at, okay, if there's some more funding from the feds, you know, should that money go to maybe some of the regional councils, which is apolitical? Right. And it doesn't, they're not going to hold that money, but they're going to make sure that these smaller, smaller cities will benefit from that. And I think that's really important. Exactly. Well, let me let me jump in here because we are running out oh, of time. <laughs> uh, actually, we're going to have to skip the Q and A uh, because we are running it up against the time limit. But I want to thank uh, you, Joy, Marge, and Alan, uh, for your participation in this uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm sure I'll speak for everybody who's been watching or listening uh, that we really appreciate your perspectives and the information uh, you shared with us. So I would only ask that you please give Joy, Marge, and Alan a virtual round of applause. Uh, well, if I, if I were there, and I live in a community with a large deaf community, we all know how you clap, do you? You raise your hands, and I wish I could show you. You raise your hands and shake them, and that's how, that's it, that's it. <laughs> so I'm doing that even though you can't see me. I do want to thank Joy and Alan for a wonderful session. We could talk on and on and on, I'm sure. And yes. I enjoy being a part of that. And I do want to once again accept, uh, please accept, um, or I want to thank Leslie and NARC's Executive Director and NARC's Board of Directors and Executive Directors Council. Uh, for joining today and making this virtual conference a success. And I guess we're going to sign off now for about a, an hour and a half. Is that right, Neil? Yes, we'll be returning at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so please join us then uh, for the remainder of today's uh, sessions. In addition, uh, it will be followed by the meeting of the NARC uh, Board of Directors. Uh, yeah, and that will be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So um, hope all of you will join us for our next session on environment and transit, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then I'll get with everybody um, for the board meeting and hopefully we'll get my webcam issue taken care of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'd like to see you, Marge. We're missing seeing you. I know, I know. I'd like to be seen. You know, I wore my yeah. suit coat every day. Hey, everybody, have a good hour and a half off. We'll join you all soon again. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to us.